Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. It's Tom Ferry in the house. I am super pumped to be coming to you guys today. By the way, happy Cinco de Mayo. You'll get this tomorrow, so I guess belated Cinco de Mayo to you. Today I'm really excited. I get to talk to a, a good friend, someone that I've been in a business mastermind with for a long time, someone that I can always call and, and rely on for innovation, ideas, CEO guidance, a swift kick in the you know what. And, uh, and you know, it's a reciprocal thing. Um, but that's the beauty of a mastermind, but more on that later. So today, if you haven't met this guy, you definitely know his company, right? He and his buddy started a company called BombBomb, which we all know is like the great video email service provider, uh, the platform that we use to communicate, to connect, to convert, uh, to build trust, to, to create relationships, and so much more. And if you haven't checked it out, by all means, check it out today. Um, the person we're talking to is Connor McCluskey. So, so uh, we're going to talk about business growth. We're, we're, this is not going to be a traditional podcast in the sense of, uh, you know, if you're a real estate agent or an entrepreneur, uh, you know, or you're a tech person, and, you know, whatever, whatever your jam is, we're going to go heavy into like marketing and SaaS and growth, right? And how these guys have built this extraordinary team and extraordinary business. So with that said, uh, so Connor, welcome, buddy. Glad to be here. Yeah, thank you, uh, thank you for joining me. So, just giving everybody context, like before I, you know, before we go into sort of the, you know, before COVID, beginning of your business, uh, you know, you know, during COVID, what have you guys done, and after COVID, what have you done, or what's the vision? Um, I think it'd be really cool to give people context for who you are. So, you know, I, I jokingly said before we started, you know, because I know you, I know you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You went to Ivy League college. You know, of course, you're the CEO of this company. You were born to do this. Um, so, so give people some context for who is Connor McCluskey? Who is Connor McCluskey? That's a great question. Um, so I didn't have a silver spoon, didn't go to college. Uh, went to one year at college, dropped out. Um, you know, I, I am a, a classic entrepreneur, um, grew up dyslexic, was called stupid, told uh, uh, all, all the people in my life, you know, older than me, told me that I wasn't going to amount to much. And, um, you know, and that was the driving force behind, you know, when people tell me I can't do something, I'm going to go do it. And so, you know, I've been described as a, uh, as my number one trait is, is perseverance. So yeah. I'm this guy that's going to come with a ton of heart. I wear it on my sleeves. I cry a lot. Um, and I just want to make a difference in this world for the better and make a giant impact. And, you know, business, obviously, um, I wasn't great at sports. I never won a trophy, all of these things that, you know, you want so bad as you're raised, as you grow up. And, um, and I, I, I found business and was like, this is something that I could win at. And the other thing I, I felt like that I could win at was relationships and building relationships with people like, I can love on people better than anybody else. You put uh, the heart test up to the, um, you, know, you know, with me, like nobody's gonna beat me on heart. I care more than anybody else and will do anything for basically anybody because I believe that all humans have intrinsic value and no matter race, gender, sexual orientation, whatever it is, um, I believe people have value just because they woke up this morning. And my goal is to um, push that out and to go uh, make right of the injustices in the world and do that through my relationships, through my businesses and through, um, you know, everything that I do every day. So Connor, there's a lot, first of all, there's a lot to, un <clears throat> excuse me, there's a lot, no editing. There's a lot to unpack there. Um, Everybody told you no, but you said yes. There's a lot of people on this planet that get told no, man, and they just, they accept it for what it is. Hey, I'm not smart enough. I'm not fast enough. I never get picked. You know, I wasn't the, the best looking guy in school. And, and they play right into that. So what, what was the moment in your life, you know, reflecting back that you were like, screw this or whatever you said to say, no, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to go for it anyway. 
Like, when was that? Was it early? Was it late? Yeah, I mean, it's survival at a certain point, right? So, like, it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't, obviously, there's forks in the road. Like, there's these moments yeah. that everybody has that they remember. On the perseverance side of thing or the heart side of things, you know, I, um, there wasn't necessarily, it was, it was a building over time. Yeah. And, and a lot of it was, you know, probably in my formative, everybody has those formative years between like 19 and 25, right. Of where a mentor came into your life and, and, and said something or, you know, or, or pushed you through there. And so, I had a mentor that that um, that kind of brought me through that time period. I had several mentors, and you outlive them, right? Like, mm-hmm. not that they outlast their usefulness, but they. Um, I had one mentor that sat me down and walked me through kind of what's your vision of your life, Connor? What's your mission? And made me think about. And Tom, you've done this with me yeah. too. Yeah. You know, you've walked me through like what does your life look like in 30 years or 20 years or 10 years and sitting down and thinking about that and writing it down, you know, but, but, it, but Connor, like dude, doing that at 1920 and I, you know, we're both blessed to have a very similar story in that. Um, there had to be some resistance. Like there's someone listening to this right now. That's like 55 and they've never done that. And they have resistance. How do you move through the, you know, don't you understand mentor as you're telling me I need to create this vision that I've got this issue and this issue and this issue and that, 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 right? Like, how did you work through the resistance? I mean, when I realized, I think it, it, I realized that when it wasn't about me, whether you, whether you believe in something bigger than yourself, whether you believe there's a heaven or a hell or an afterlife or not, what, whatever your belief system is, you know, you got to kind of start with that fundamentals of what is this life all about? Where did I come from and where am I going? Yeah. And, and when you take yourself out of, out of it and say, this is where people get stuck is when it's about them. Yeah. And, and when you, when you start thinking that when you start looking from the outside in and not the inside out, that is when, you know, you, you, you kind of have that transformation of like, and you got to do it every day. Right. Because this is your perspective from the inside out. And so unless you're not grateful, unless you're not, you know, every day I wake up and I am grateful, I, you know, I say my prayer and I'm like, thank you, you know, for all of the things that I have, no matter how horrible my day is or all the crap I got to go through, I am grateful for what I have because there's always somebody that has more and less. And so, you know, I, I just, this just made me think of a turning point. So I was in Africa uh, in Kenya and um, was visiting a friend of mine and I was walking through a slum and I took my, both my father and my sister to Africa. Um, this is before Bomb Bomb. Well, this is actually, I'd started Bomb Bomb or started developing the idea of Bomb Bomb. Bomb Bomb hadn't been formed yet. This was 2004, five. And, um, and I was walking through this and my fa- I'm videotaping my father in this slum. It's, um, these huts that people made out of garbage and this old man is, la- is, is sitting on the ground. He can't get up. And my dad breaks down, gets down on his knees and the guy's talking to him and they're translating. He says, my wife and kids and family have all died of starvation and I will too. And I got back a couple weeks later and was editing the video. And I called my buddy Richard over in Kenya and said, what happened to that old man? And he said, he died. And it was the first time in my life of where I was like, I have met somebody 
that has died of starvation and I have more than enough in my cupboard and that happened on my watch and from that day forward, I shaved my head and I said, I am going to go and do something about this. And so, yeah. So that was a turning point. I don't, I don't know if that really answers your question, but. Oh, no. I mean, it absolutely. So I think, you know, because you and I have had so many conversations over the years, like I, I, I remember the essence of that story and I'm glad that you were sharing it here. I think the, the key for the listener right now is look, everybody's got a story, right? And, and it always goes back to the same thing. Is it the hero's journey or is it the zero's journey, right? Like, do you zero out because of the past or do you say, of course it's gonna be hard. It was hard for everyone that was great. Everybody got punched in the face. Everybody had these defining moments. And you know, Connor's defining moment and, and Connor share from that moment when you said like, hey, I'm gonna, I shaved my head and said, I'm gonna do something about this. I know we're gonna get into sort of this whole contribution side of your life, but let's just jump there now for a moment. What did you do? Yes, so um, this is a little bit of the bomb bomb story too. Was yeah. I quit my job. I was a billboard salesman mm -hmm. um, selling billboards. And um, I, I basically quit my job um, and I, I had bought a, uh, a cherry orchard and started bomb bomb about you know three months earlier or at least started the development of it and so i was i i had thought i'd built up there's two companies that were public at the time salesforce and constant contact yep. so i went and i basically looked at all their their s1s and all their quarterly and annual reports and then i said software as a service, this recurring revenue business. Yeah. I'm going to build up a business that's 10 grand a month. And then I'm going to use that to go to Africa and make a difference and not let another guy starve or at least try and make a dent in that problem. Because now I've seen it, I've been a witness to it. I need to do something about it. So I need to go start businesses in Africa in order to help people and um, help out widows and orphans and the people that are, you know, in a worse position than, than what I am. And like, I need to dedicate my life to this. And, you know, Connor, some people say those kind of things, but you're living it, right? I mean, you built this monster business, which we're going to get into the origin of it. And we're going to talk about growth today, but I think it's so important for the person listening right now that when you, when you talk to, to entrepreneurs, <clears throat> look, some people say, like, I'm doing it just for the money. And then there's other people that say, like, I saw this massive problem I wanted to solve, right? And sometimes it's the, the sol like, your product is the solution. And sometimes it's the Connor, you know, Connor's thing is, I saw this problem happening all over the world. And what if I built a business that gave me the extra capital to go work on solving that, right? But like, fundamentally, that's business, like, identify a problem and solve it. Sometimes the problem is I have no money, I want to solve that. Sometimes it is, you know, a guy died and I want to, I want to do everything in my power to fix that. So we're going to, we're going to weave in, you know, in and out of this story, but take us back to the origin of bomb bomb, like, and just maybe just for the person that doesn't know what bomb bomb is, tell them what bomb bomb is like just the like two second version. And then we'll get into the origin. Yeah. So bomb bomb is a video messaging tool that enables you to stay face to face in a in a in a not a live way it's not like zoom yeah it's, you're able to send a video to somebody and they're able to consume it on their time whether it's through a text message through email um or and you can post it to social media too and so we make that really easy and fast and so yeah. you can track that and, and all that um so take us Take us back to the beginning. So, you know, you're sitting there, it's 2004 or five, you come back from Kenya and you're like, okay, I'm gonna quit my job. I'm looking at Tristan right now. I'm gonna quit my job and I'm gonna start a cherry farm and a software company. Were you smoking weed? Like what, what, what who says that stuff? It seems like it. Yeah, I joke that I smoked weed. I was a huge pothead early on, like in college, I was a huge pothead. And then, nice. um, yeah don't smoke pot. So, um, it, uh, yeah. So I was at Lamar and actually I, 
I had ran a business with my now business partner, Darren. Yeah. And um, we did, we were a service business. We did apartment complexes. We did all the services for apartment complexes. Okay. Um, and we had built up that business into uh, 9-11. The first time I went to Kenya, we went big. We were like, we're going to be the Walmart of service companies into a, you know, a recession and, and lost everything. So I went and I got an internship. I went from running about 60 people. We were about a $3 million business or $2 million business. And, um, and then basically was living in somebody's basement and got an internship at, at Lamar, quickly built up my business and went through the real estate side of billboards, went through all of these uh, different things, learned the whole business, and then got into sales. Built up my business to about 150 customers. And I was literally a door-to-door -door salesman. Yeah. And um, I was like, this sucks. I hate this. Like, how can I? And I was like, when my 150 customers, if they just saw me once a month, because whenever I could get a meeting with them and meet with them and talk marketing and give ideas, they would always buy more billboards for me. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, how do I stay face to face with all of my customers on a monthly basis? Cause I just did the backwards math, right? Tom, like, I was like, I got 150 customers. There's this many hours in the day. All the, you know, and I'm like, okay, I can only set so many meetings. So I'm doing the backwards math. And I was like, what if I could send a video through an email? And I was like, there's got to be a company that does this. So I scour the internet and there isn't one. And so my buddy was uh, the video professor at Colorado College. And um, he, I was like, hey man, let's get on a green screen. So we go and we green screen it out. And then I put a server in our office, host the video, and then we make some HTML and send it out to all 150 people. Uh, and within 48 hours, I had email, like 50 to 70 emails and phone calls. Like people like, dude, that was awesome. This is amazing. I want to buy a bunch of billboards from you. No, that's not what they said. Yeah. They said, how do I do this, man? <laughs> exactly. I, and then that was when the light bulb went off and I was like, okay, I need to do something. So, so I want to just, I want to just make a point to everybody. So having started multiple businesses myself and so has Connor and so have you, right? And, and so many of my mentors, everyone says kind of this, like, remember like, what's the problem I want to solve or like, what am I trying to accomplish here? And like, that sort of becomes the origin of your business. The other one is the question, right? The question. Uh, so I always go back to my mentor, Mike Vance, who said, you know, do you know how Bill Gates started his company? And I said, no, he said, he wrote down this question. How could we have the software that all computers run on? Like that was the question. And then Walt Disney was, what if there was a park where all the horses jumped and there was no chip paint. And he was referring to, you know, the park that he would go to in LA and watch his daughter go on the merry-go-round, but all the horses didn't move and there was a lot of chip paint. And he's like, what if, what if, right? And voila, we have Disney, right? So, so the question of like, how do I do this? So how did you, I mean, there was nothing there. We're talking 2004, five, when was this? Yeah, this was, this was 2005 into six. So there's no iPhone, right? There's no iPhone. There's no iPad. Everything. There's no, there's, there was Facebook, but I don't think anybody knew about it yet. Right. So, so just kind of like for context, people. Facebook wasn't even there either. So YouTube was just getting going yes. at that point. Yeah. And so, and Google had not bought it. Uh -uh. So literally at the end of 2006 i had started the business in october mm -hmm. and um or november was when we when we formed the corporation and in january of seven was when google bought youtube I and i go it was on the front of the wall street journal for a billion and a half dollars and i yep. was like i was like game over yeah. it's over all right i'm gonna throw in the towel the idea is take they're gonna do this and <laughs> I was very naive at that point. Yeah. Didn't really understand how huge the market was. And so 
Tell us about how you built it, right? Not, and I don't mean like the engineering technical side, because I know that's not your skill set. But like, you know, you, you probably said like, who do I know? Who do I know? Who do I know? And how do I? And, and how long was it before that product actually existed? Like, give us a little of that context. Yeah, so we, so I went through the whole development process, didn't get a product. Mm -hmm. Then I went through three development outsource crews before. So it wasn't September, September 3rd of 2007, we launched Yeah. from the formation was in November of six. So that long to actually get a product in three different groups that I basically took out a second mortgage on my house. I was going to ask you, how did you like, and you all pay for of this? my life savings. So yeah. my 401 K I liquidated right yep. about a month before the crash. Good timing, by the way. Was the follow was the follow yeah. on investments? Yeah. You know, I convinced Darren to give me some money. Um, Darren's his Darren's his business partner. Dar yeah. Darren's my business partner. Yeah. Um, at Bomb Bomb, if you know him. Um, and then, uh, and and so, got the product. Went to my billboard customers. Tried to convince them to do it. Only one bought. And what I did was I sold Bomb Bomb. And at this time, Bomb Bomb didn't have, I mean, we didn't have an email editor. We didn't, basically, I would have to upload the video to a server and then we would place it into their account and they logged in all these different things. Yeah. But it was very early and rudimentary. And, um, but I literally would go, I went and bought a, or I borrowed a camera from my friend, a, a nice camera and microphone and everything. And then I went and bought a, a uh, MacBook Pro and got Final Cut Pro and taught myself video editing and taught myself video recording because the number one problem people had with this whole concept was how do I make a video? Yeah. By the way, I don't think it's, it, it, it's, it's May 5th, 2020 and there's still people that have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> As much as you've solved it, there's still people that are like, I don't, what do I say? I don't, ah. Like not a single person that I talked to was like, oh yeah, I could do that. So I would yeah. literally yeah. go and videotape everything, edit it, upload it, send it out and, and give them the results of what happened. Yes. So you were, you did everything beginning to end for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Watch that wasn't very scalable. I was not very scalable, but here's what happened. Every time I sent a video and it would take me, you know, 20 minutes to send out a video email, which at yeah. the time was way more efficient than what you'd have to do from when I very started. Yep. But like people weren't going to be able to do that. People weren't yeah. going to do that. Um, and so I would literally, um, I would literally, do the video encoding on my, I was, I was telling our, our, we have a whole video triad with multiple engineers and product managers and all this, just working on our video technology. One of yeah. seven groups of people that work on different parts of our, of our technology. And they're working on our encoding uh, piece. And I was walking them through all the things. I was like, let me talk to you about Kodaks and bit rates and all these all these different things. Cause I actually had to do it manually Yes, and put it onto our servers at the time after I did all of the, the, the actual recording film it, edit. Yeah. There's, there's a lot to it. So, um, so, so at yeah. What, at what point did, did bomb bomb become the company we know it today? And I mean, obviously the, the product continues to evolve, right. But, but at, at what point is it more closer to, you know, grab my phone, hit the app or inside of Gmail, shoot a video. I send the video to a client, right? The second they, they open it, my phone goes ding. And I'm like, Oh, my prospect just opened my email. Ding. My prospect just watched my video. Like that. I mean, that's a major leap from where you started. When did you get to that point? Probably 2000. Well, the beginning of that 2012. Yeah. So it was five years of just grinding it out. Did you guys make any money between 2007 and 2012? 
Um, we were 2000. Notice, notice his pause. He's not counting the millions in case you're wondering, my friends. <laughs> no, 2013, I think was when we did a million dollars in revenue. So oh we, God. um, the other thing was we were doing, I was doing anything to make payroll. So I was like yeah. doing paper click SEO, building websites, like, I did anything, any side hustle that could make me money. Yeah. Um, we were doing, Darren came on in 2011 and we had, I'll just give you a bomb bomb customers. We had 36 when I brought in Darren. 36 clients paying how much per month? It might've been like a couple thousand bucks a month or something like that. Yeah. Total. Okay. But those are like larger enterprise relationships, not I would like, you know, I was a hand to hand. So I'd be like, I think I could get 700 bucks out of these guys a month. Like, yeah. cause I'm going to do this, this and that. So like, it was like a hodgepodge. Like some people were paying 14 bucks and some people were paying 700 bucks. And wow. so welcome to the entrepreneurial spirit here, my friends. So. It was like anything I could get from anybody I would, I would do. So, you know, it was custom deals. Yeah, so Darren started and then. Okay, I just want to stop for a second. We're talking to one of the smartest SaaS guys I know, like, you know, going to conferences like Saster, Jason Lemkin. We're talking about, you know, every, every software company on the planet now is reoccurring revenue based. Everybody's moved away from buy my box, upload your software. Instead, they're like, there is no box. It's all in the clouds. It's $29 a month. It's $49 a month. Salesforce, my goodness, like, you know, $300,000 a year, right? As an example, right? For, for all the people we work with and, and like, like that's the new norm and you've, you, you dominate that space now. I mean, like you're, you're one of the smartest guys I know in the space, not trying to, you know, pump your ego up, but like you are my go-to guy to say, MRR is here. How do I add more? What's the, you know, what do I do next? How in the world did you learn all of that? Yeah. So, well, back in the day, there was right now, like starting a SaaS company. Now you have Saster wow. and yeah. all these, yeah. it's this like really nice and easy. Yeah. So, um, basically one of the, one of, one of our early kind of friends and family investors, he knew a CFO of a company, um, that's now true commerce. Um, yeah. and, uh, and, and basically he was like, I'll meet, I'll, I'll go out to lunch with you. And so like, he walked me through the unit economics and how SaaS companies are evaluated. Yep. And I was like, oh man, here's how you can make a lot of money. Um, you know, this is a compounding thing and the economics are different than a typical business, right? It's not EBITDA, it's not, it's the future earnings and churn and all of this. So the, the, the unit economics of the SaaS business are completely different than a normal, whether it's manufacturing or retail or anything like that. Um, and so, once I started figuring out how those unit economics works, he gave me Bessemer's 10 laws of cloud computing. And this was 2000. Okay. Say it one more time, but really fast, everybody like say it again, really quick. Bessemer's, uh, 10 laws of cloud computing. Do you recommend that for everybody listening right now? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it, it was, it was kind of that Genesis of yeah, like biblical, how the unit economics of a sat, like how, what are all the multipliers of these companies and why are they getting these valuations? And, and wall street hadn't really understood what Salesforce was doing and all that. And all these guys were getting beat up on this and they didn't understand the business model basically, but they put this together and I read it and I was like, it, this is what I've been looking for, right? Yeah. Like this yeah. is what, this is, this is the blueprint. This, this is, is the roadmap. The, this is the language. This is the blueprint. This is, this is where, this is where I fit. I felt like I was a part of something then like, and everything like I instinctively thought, but couldn't put words or like a blueprint to like, that was it. And so it, um, so it was a huge turning point. And then that's when I went and, 
took the S S ones and and of of constant contact and Salesforce, and then I I just it's like you know they're like eighty page you know things, and I'm reading through the details like the number of you know support people and how they break down the gross margins, and then was was like fitting that into our business based on. Salesforce, which is a 90% gross margin business compared to constant contact, which is a, you know, 72% gross margin business. And how do we fit in that? And, and so I was reverse engineering a business model from those two things and that whole thing and looking at the forced multipliers on how the business actually works. So you know, business model is obviously a huge thing. Absolutely. I mean, for everybody watching, like this is the, there's a lot of insights in this conversation, obviously having that early mentor and mentors always like you, we both still have them today that challenge us to do more that push us beyond our limitations, but also like just so, finding the problem that you want to solve. What's the problem you want to solve, whether it's in the universe and the universe could be in your community, it could be, you know, in your network, it could be in your marketplace or it could be in the world. Right. And then you got to just start. And, and, you know, I was like, you know, Greer, who's a mutual friend of ours who started, you know, Boomtown, same thing, took a, took a loan out of his house to start his business. Both of you guys started basically right in the crash of 2007, eight, nine, 10, right. Which makes a lot of people battle tested would be one way to describe it. <laughs> right? Like I, we started in 2004 and got up to $10 million in revenue and went right into the crash. Right? I mean, it's the same. So, you know, I, we know what it's like to go hero zero, holy crow, which, which that, that brings me to like, I want to get very, I want to get granule for a second. You, you know, you were giving insight on Saster and one of the things that, you know, we are SaaS based companies. One of the things we know is, you know, in the world of SaaS, it is about finding multiple different ways to grow your business, right? Kind of the culture of ABT, always be testing. Um, so I wrote down for you, like, as your business matures, so does the business intelligence specifically around marketing strategies and tactics, right? Marketing strategies. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you like, just I'm going to give you a bunch of words, right? These are all different like drivers of growth, right? In any business. And what I want you to do is just share what you did that worked, what you did that didn't, and just give us insight on it. Like we're gonna go deep on a whole bunch of marketing and lead generation right now. So um, let, let's start with the first one, uh, trade shows. Yeah, trade shows um, actually worked really well for us. Um, so, you know, I'll tell you the story of, you know, it was early 2012, Steve Passanelli, which is now our CMO, was uh, the head of tech savvy agent. Um, and he was looking for a, uh, email marketing tool, didn't like constant contact, didn't like MailChimp, found bomb bomb, sent out a video to a hundred thousand people. We signed up like 40 real estate agents in one day. We were signing up like six people a day at that point. Yes. So all of a sudden to get 40, we were like, what the heck happened? Then we find this guy, we talked to Steve. Uh, Keller Williams finds out about us. They say, hey, you should come to family reunion in two weeks. We'll yep. fast track you through our program. We show up and literally I wouldn't go to the bathroom from 6 a.m. till seven o'clock at night because people were waiting um, uh, basically for us to, to get something. So it took off. We sold we basically doubled our company in a day at Keller Williams. Um, you're like, you're like, thank, thank you, Gary Keller and Chris Heller. <laughs> right? like, um, you know, it, uh, we were at 500 customers and we went to a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So hold on though. Not all trade shows work. Not all you trade shows work. And, and it's the strategy of the trade show. So, so, what like because you know like uh, maybe there's somebody watching it right now like my buddy uh steve right who owns um a juice company right we're we, we're doing a podcast that's coming out in the next couple of weeks and he's got nectar juice this like 350 stores across the u.s exploding right like maybe if he goes to a trade show he's gonna be like this is stupid i'm one of like 700 booths how do i get attention so what did you guys do that got attention and then let's go off trade shows and do another one because i got a whole bunch to go through 
Yeah. So, you know, one would, we would, we would, we would look at relationships. So like, for instance, we would say, Hey, Steve, how many speaking deals do you have? And yeah. Hey, do you know about this is what we're doing? Hey, would this fit into your talk? And then we would go to all the influencers, right? Like, and say, Hey man, this is what we're doing and build those relationships, go out to dinner with them, talk to them, all of that. And so, you know, you've got people talking about you. That's a third party that, you know, that, that are either using your product or know about your product and what you're doing. And then we would actually do edge. So most booths are like just selling stuff. We would do education. So we would go in and we would say, we would tell stories about how people are using the product and how they could win with it. And we would just tell stories and then, and then people would connect with those stories and be like, I, this is me. They relate to it because it's a story. And then they would be like, how do I sign up for this thing? And so, yeah. you know, instead of, we went the opposite way when, and now everybody does it because literally people are like, how do you guys do what you do at these trade shows? And then they just go copy us. Um, and, you know, we're happy to tell people what to do, but yeah, it, it, it worked great for us. And then, you know, and, and then when you're in the, you know, and a lot of it is, is luck on trade shows, you know, we, we, um, you know, where you're positioned all of that, but we would have strategies like, where do we position and we would be working people and you know, it would, it, it was a lot of strategy sessions on how to do it. Yeah. I would say it's, it's, it's like an agent watching this right now who does open houses, right? Like if you just say, Hey, I'm going to show up at this open house, you know, Sunday from one to four, you're going to get a certain result. But if you're like, how am I going to market it? How am I going to get, you know, am I going to email my clients to tell them to invite me? Am I going to do something on Facebook? Like, it's all the money at trade shows or open houses or even doing a seminar as an example, all the money's made in the pre-work, right? In the strategy of who can I get? Who are the influencers? Who, you know, how do I get people to show up and say, I want more of this? Love it. Okay. And okay, the let's iteration see. through it, right? Right. So you, what went wrong there? Like, okay, what went wrong was when it took them 50 seconds to sign up when we had a rush, so how do we take, get that down to 10 seconds and get that more efficient? So, because people aren't going to wait in line. That's so right. like you're strategizing and iterating yep. to make it better, basically. Yeah. It's the, you know, the, the Amazon model, right? How do I have no friction in the process of getting what it is I want, signing up and having it delivered. Right. Um, so what about webinars? Did you guys ever use webinars or, you know, a way there's like, like go to your website, watch something or participate in something or, you know, do a live and, and if so, what worked, what didn't? Yeah. Webinars. Um, what didn't work was how we started off with webinars and that's a product walkthrough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hi, come sit through my boring product demo. I was, I was great at the online demo, but like nobody bought from it. Right. And yeah. so you know, Steve's a master at this. Um, our CMO, Steve Passanelli, is a master at webinars and just getting people pumped. And so, you know, whether it's, it, it, it is, you know, a lot of it comes down to the stories that people can relate to and them seeing themselves being able to actually do that. So, you know, we tell a lot of stories in webinars um, and then, you know, Steve will put in a theme um, and then go around and then bring in personal stories so people can relate to them. It's a, he, he's a master at it and, and um, yeah, we're lucky to have him. I mean, wouldn't you say it's really like when you're doing that stuff, like right now, again, I'm, I'm referencing, you know, some of our agent clients that here we are during COVID four weeks ago, Connor, we started saying to our clients, you should be doing a seminar on Zoom, where people have to register so you capture all their information, but the seminar is called the five mistakes to avoid in buying a home during COVID or, you know, the, the seven deadly sins of trying to sell your home during COVID and guess what's happening, right? All they're doing is doing an educate, like here are the five mistakes. And oh, by the way, as they're going through the mistakes, they say things like, you know, I know a lot of you will have personal questions, you know, just go ahead and email me, you know, TF at, you know, banana real estate.com. And I can answer those personal questions. Let's go to mistake number four. Right. And in that process, right. 
talking through the pain points, the mistakes that people make, that's where they get the best interaction. Yep. Well, and it's the value. You're leading with value. You're not right. selling them something. No. It's like, no. I'm going to give you a demo and then ask you to buy, right? Yeah. It's yeah. like, I'm just going to give you value. It's what you do basically every day, Tom. It's yeah. like, you're just trying to put out value. And then when somebody says, ah, I need coaching, you're the yeah. guy that they're going to go to, right? Like, yep. because you're constantly adding value to them. Yeah. And not, not necessarily asking for anything in return. It's like, Hey man, I want to build into this community, add value and be the, the authority here to be the go-to guy that, you know, when people need these things, they're going to think of you. Right. Being, being the resource, being the educator, right? That's, we've talked about it multiple times. Okay. Referrals. What is the best referral campaign and what was the worst referral campaign? In case you're wondering how it's, what it's like to do a podcast with Tom Ferry, zero prep, just go at him. You know, the, uh, you know, we, we actually, um, you know, over the past six months, we, we, you know, and, and probably anybody that is listening to this knows that it's really hard to ask. <laughs> like people just don't do it. And even when you have systems, like, people get out of the system because like, and so like we literally, we literally, um, I think it's um, uh, over the past couple of weeks or last couple months, we put in place like, how, are we asking for referrals? Like, yeah. especially from the people that are like crushing it with our product, like who would this, who would this be good for? Like, do you know anybody you can yeah. refer us to? And we built a system and process which we've done like more than three times, I know for sure. And somehow you always get off of it. And so, you know, I would, the thing that works is just doing it, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. I love it. Thanks. I mean, that was raw and real. That was raw and real. Do you, we don't do it though. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so I'm gonna hit you with a different one. Uh, digital ads and display ads. Right, digital pay per clicks, you know, Google, Facebook, and then display. You know, I literally had a client. You're not going to believe this, Connor. Actually, you you will appreciate this. Uh, she sends me a photo, and it's a Tom Ferry ad. So she had clicked on one of my ads, and you know, using retargeting, I had been following her around the internet, and she was on Tinder, and that's where she did the photo snap and sent it to me. She goes, "You follow me everywhere." I'm like, "Yeah, but you're on Tinder." <laughs> I was like, are you prospecting? So digital ads, display ads, give us some insight there. I mean, this is where you guys kill it. Yeah, you, you know, we on the digital side, you know, we, we do them all, right? Um, and what we've, what we've found is that basically they, I'll give you an example, like pay-per-click, right? Like, it's cyclical almost yes like it 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 works for a while and then conversion rates drop off and and you know you're not getting the best bang for the buck or you're buying too much of your own branded keywords and yeah. it's like am i going to get these conversions anyways as long as my you know as long as my serps and everything are 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 good and so you know you go through here and and then you've got competition you know, that comes in and, and will buy, you know, your keywords or whatever. And so, you know, it's been very cyclical. I will say right now, you know, it's so in all of these strategies, it comes down to how much it costs you to acquire and the lifetime value of that customer. Yeah. And you constantly have to look at it and try and test, right? Yeah. Because for instance, you know, Google pay per click wasn't working as well and Bing wasn't working as well for us in January, but now we're absolutely crushing it. And I'm like, come on guys, like let's, why aren't we buying more? Because yeah. for every dollar I spend right now, I'm getting two back. And so yes. like, why aren't, you know, and they're giving me, you know, they're like, well, the algorithm, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, don't, don't, don't give me this. Like that, that algorithm will, Google will let you spend. Yeah. So as long as that pays off and you're looking at it every day, 
you want to look at what is the customer lifetime value and how much can can I do? And right now, ad platforms are really on sale. Facebook, yep. so yep. we're seeing upticks in Facebook. We're seeing it in pay per click. We're seeing it um, all over the place. And then you got to think about you know the the uh, the marketing side or the branding side of it too. Like in all of this kind of hunkering down, what is the brand that people see? Because when they do get back are you going to be top of mind and, and will you be there? And so, you know, I don't have any magic bullets here. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, always and there be are none. Yeah. Always be testing, right? Have a goal in mind, right? If you're, if we're just talking Google analytics, right? Just setting up in your Google ad manager, like here is my campaign. Here is my goal. Here is my budget. How did I do? Right. It really is. It's, and if you're not, and if you can't basic. measure, then you shouldn't, you yeah. shouldn't spend the money before yeah. you build the thing to measure it. Right. Yeah. Like, so like we pulled back on a lot of stuff when we, we recently over like, we're constantly rebuilding our, our processes and our, and our, um, our systems as we scale. And so sometimes you got to pull back in order to yeah. get the measurements in place because you're getting bad data. hundred percent. So, so, I mean, I could go through all these, but I want to ask you what, what has been the biggest driver of growth? What, what lead system or strategy like really moved the needle for you guys and, and either it, it no longer does, but at one point it was the thing. Um, well, there's a couple things. So, so yeah. like, uh, you know, we talked about trade shows. That was a huge thing for us yeah. in a new market getting our names out there, meeting the influencers, getting face to face, building relationships. Like that's how I met you, right? Yeah. Like we were at an industry thing and, and that's how we met. Um, and then, you know, all of these strategies, like pay-per-click was a big thing for us for a while. Yeah. Um, social has been less for us, but it's coming on strong now. Um, and I'll say we did a, um, you know, um, we recently, uh, right when all this COVID stuff started, we, um, you know, Darren's wife is a uh, high school counselor and she uses bomb bomb, of course, to send out, um, kind of canned message video messages to response to te to parents and, and because she gets the same kind of questions yeah. and she'll have, you know, little snippets in her Gmail and she'll send them out and they'll be like, thank you so much for sending that personal video. Yep. <laughs> and, um, and so right when, before it went public that the schools were going to shut down um, internally, they were kind of scrambling on what they were going to do. And all right. these teachers this evening came in and were like, okay, we're going remote. What's the co how do we get bomb bomb accounts? Yeah. And we're like, you know, teachers don't make that much money and you know, they're, you know, they're, they're scrambling to get this and know, you know, the, the hierarchy and, in in the school districts is crazy. And so that next day it was pitched by Rebecca Spomar, VP of uh, partnerships she had the exact thing that Darren had the night before with her. She had an interaction with the teacher and she pitched it to the leadership group and said, how can we give free bomb bomb accounts to teachers? And, um, and Steve and the whole, we, we got every, the whole company, 150 people on a zoom call and said, here's the idea. We know it's a crazy time, but we want to launch free bomb bomb to teachers and we want to do it in the next 24 hours. How would we do that? And the whole company rallied together from customer support to marketing and training to dev to get these free accounts and all yeah. this stuff. All and the landing pages um, that need to be built uh, and yep, yep. all the stuff. And 24 hours later, we launched it. Um, uh, both internally, all, we told all of our employees to push it out onto social media, and then we pushed it out to all of our customers, and we had, you know, 
thousands of teachers sign up overnight, basically. And, um, and then what happened was, and this is one of uh, Bessemer's 10, 10 laws of cloud computing, is that when, if your product, when it's used, it spreads. Yep. yep. Um, it, uh, it really accelerated our business um, in, a, in a real positive way. One, that we were, we were living out our values um that we were you know we rallied as a team and brought everybody together and it just built this um sense of coming together and and like you know i've been telling a lot of people the reason what like literally our business was created for a time like this to make an impact in people's lives and to be able to get to build relationships when people are in zoom fatigue and all of that like Sometimes you want to reach out to people and get face to face with them and you, you're not going to be able to get them live, but you still want to connect in that face to face way and bomb bomb enables you to do that. So it's been a, um, it's been a huge thing for our numbers and just the reach and the, and, and all of that. And it connects to all of those things. Um, it was kind of a perfect storm in a good way that came together and got, it- got a lot of momentum. Was the intent uh, that the teachers would eventually sign up and, and become paid subscribers? Like a lot of, you know, a lot of us understand the sort of freemium model, you know, try it for a day, try it for a month, try it for a week. I, I, I get the sense that that wasn't the intent. Yeah, no, we talked about that. We were like, well, should we try and sell it? Or, you know, like, what should we, because, you know, as a business, we're like, we don't know what's going to happen. Like, right. we don't know if, you know, half of our customers are going to cancel next week. Like, and so, but we decided we were like, you know what? Like, let's just, let's just give this for free. And we, you know, we didn't say forever, but that was kind of the, you know, we're like maybe a year or whatever. And we just kind of said, just make it free for teachers, send it out and we can deal with it in a year. And, you know, we'll see, we'll see what happens. So, uh, it, you know, I, I, one of the things that I wrote down, like I remember sitting with my executive team and I want to ask you the same thing. So, you know, it's, this is my first day back in my office in eight weeks, right? So the Friday before I want to say this, like maybe the 16th, um, you know, chatting with my team, like, Hey, like the world is shifting, something's going on. Let's, you know, let's, let's go buy everybody a laptop. Let's get everybody a Slack account. Let's get everybody a remote, you know, phone. And like, you know, you start, you start going down that path. And then it was literally two or three in the afternoon on Tuesday, the 19th. By that time we were pretty much already out of the office that California said, okay, everybody's going remote, but I will tell you, and I want to know what, you know, what you guys did. I know the Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, up until that point, you know, we were like in a, in a similar situation. And the thing that was on my wall is doing the right thing is always like the right thing. Do you know what I mean? And like, when I think about that campaign, like it's like, I looked and said, okay, what do we stand for? I'm, I'm, you don't know, I'm grabbing all my values as a company, right? And like, we build and maintain trust. We deliver more value than is expected. You know, like we're constantly innovating. And I just, we, we put all that up on the wall and then started to create the strategy like for this sort of during COVID mode. So, so besides the, the teacher campaign, which is beautiful, what did you do as the CEO of the company when this thing was unfolding? Like, how did you shift? How did you pivot? Did you pivot? What did you do to navigate your 150 people through this and, you know, your tens of thousands of clients? Yeah. So we, um, so Darren and I got together. Darren was like, okay, um, let's do a practice run next Wednesday mm-hmm. to go full remote. Yeah. Right. So this was the Wednesday before. So we were like a week out, we'll practice this with everybody. It developed really quickly on a Wednesday night into a Thursday. And we were like, we might have to go full remote now. Yeah. And so we sent out a bomb bomb to everybody, Slack, videos, everything to the whole company and said, Come in Friday, get your, whatever you need, your monitor or whatever. We're going full remote for at least two weeks. And so, you know, we looked at it and said, we would rather go early. Yeah. 
you know, um, and and be safe and have our people safe and 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 luckily we you know since the beginning we've always even though our culture is very much in our building yeah we everybody in our whole company has laptops um and so we were able to do that fairly easily um you know the culture thing has suffered a little bit but um it's um that that that's been more challenging because the you know we we eat lunches together like as a company we do all hands meetings all the time um and i could talk to you a little bit about there's been some really there's been some positives to going full remote too <laughs> i was going to say to you yeah we've had the same thing but let's tell me so what's the culture i want to know how have you tried to fix it and what's been the positives Yes. Yeah, so um, a part of BombBomb, Bomb, we have this thing called the people team that is uh, voted on and people and it's from every aspect of the organization we have um, in the people team, we have um, three kind of pillar groups that get together and it's fun and events, um, values in action and diversity and inclusion. And so each one of those groups gets together and then we come together as a whole people team group. And we, and, and it came out of kind of this idea of how do we continually build culture and, and live it. Yeah, right. Right. You, you, you talked about like living, it's one thing to put these things up on the wall, but it's another thing to actually live it out and measure that living out. Like a part of our quarterly planning and strategic planning is how have, give me stories of how we've lived the core values in the last quarter. And if we're not telling stories about it, then we're not living it. Bingo. And so we got together and one of the, in the diversity inclusion, um, uh, one of the people said, you know, it'd be really cool is if we could do, so me and Darren have fireside chats, basically kind of uh, three times a quarter. And it's kind of like a town hall or whatever, but they were like, what if we could do a fireside chat with a group of people that tell their story in the context of diversity and inclusion. And so, you know, we got people from everything from um, a bipolar person to, um, you know, to, um, uh, what was the, what were the other people? Um, you know, one person uh, was LGBTQ, um, you know, uh, and, and, you know, there's a bunch of, bunch of different people basically. Mm -hmm. And they got on and we had, I think it was about a hundred of our people actually showed up to a Zoom meeting. So there was a hundred people on the deal and they had a moderator and they just started asking questions about, um, tell us a story about how you've been treated in a workplace or whatever. And the vulnerability and courage of right. these people as, so this one guy led and he just put it out there, like went for it. And, you know, people were stunned at the story because it was a tragic story, Yeah. but the courage and connection that people got in the comments, like, I love you. You're the most courageous person. And then like, just, just, and then that set the tone for all the other people to tell right. their stories. Right. And it was, it was, I mean, it's giving me goosebumps right now. Like my hair is standing up on my arms. Like it, you know, and, and, and afterwards I like zoomed every single one of them and was like, first of all, that is the most courageous thing I've ever seen anybody do. You, thank you. You know, and, and it just brought us together in a way. And I think that the medium actually helped. Yeah. I agree. Like the, the fact that they're like, it's not like I'm in a room with a bunch of people. They're not Tom Ferry. Like Tom, you can stand in front of a million people and be really comfortable because you've done it a hundred times. But these people, you know, even in front of a hundred people, but because of the medium that they were using with video, it was, it like, it opened up these floodgates of, of human connection in a way that like, I mean, people were crying and like, it just, 
it, it, it really made an impact and helped, you know, and it was led by our people. Bingo. It was Bingo. led by our people and it was them connection. And, and they were like, and, th and then they were thanking the company for like putting it on. They were like, we've never been at a company that has been so open and, yep. and the ability yep. for us to have a voice. And this goes all the way back to kind of my intrinsic value of people. Like we all have our own beliefs and, you know, political affiliations and all of this. But at the end of the day, like, guys, how do we come together? Because we're all human and we all got problems and we all, and, and when people take away all of that stuff and just, once people start having that empathy, it's, um, it's magical. It's absolutely magical. And so it, um, it was really awesome. It was really awesome. So I love a, it, man. That, that's been a good story. So yeah, that's, that is, uh, that's awesome on a lot of levels. And, and by the way, you know, knowing Connor as well as I know him, um, like I'm, I'm literally staring at a screen watching you with the camera right here and Tristan over here. Like, like I can see your passion. Like I can see the essence of you coming out as you're telling that story. Cause it's so real for you. Right. It, it makes your heart sing and you know, goosebumps, truth bumps. Right. Um, so, so let's go a totally different direction. Right. Now I want to know, let's, we'll, we'll, let's, we'll, we'll end sort of on this conversation, which is what do you think is, is sort of business in life after COVID? Like what do you, Hey, what do you keep from what you guys have done and what do you not keep? And then where do you see the opportunities to solve more problems going through this? Yep. Yeah. It's, um, God, I've read too much on this. Um, yeah. <laughs> you know, it, what I do know is, is things have changed and they 100%. will, they, and, and, and some things won't go back yeah. to way, the way they were. Yeah. Um, you know, one thing that, so over the past 10 years, whether it's corporate America or, you know, small business um, or very small business is actually ahead of corporate America in this is the digital transformation of our businesses, right? Mm -hmm. And so this thing literally has accelerated that in lightning speed. If you look at, you know, if you look at, you know, the numbers on Zoom from 10 million to 200 million in two weeks, I read an article where they talked about how they compared it to Facebook and Google, how Google had this massive problem of scaling to be a actual utility yep. in two years and Zoom had two weeks. And that is not going back. No. It's a, the new way of business. It's what you've been talking about with video, like for literally years, um, now it's a necessity. Now it's the way of business. And I think, you know, depending on where, whether you're a conspiracy theorist or, you know, or, or you're, you know, you're falling in line with what we should be doing, you know, and the whole spectrum in between, you know, things are, things are going to be different. And, you know, some people just aren't going to be comfortable in these settings, you know, sports has changed all of these things, uh, going to concerts, like, when are we going to go back and like, right. when's the, what's the next COVID, right? Like it's, it's changed literally travel industries, in entirely and we don't know what that's going to be but what i do know moving forward is that that digital transformation is happening at an accelerated rate and it's not going back like the people that have resisted all of these years like they're not going to go back to resistance and it's just going to be the way of the world now it's just that's that's how it's going to be um and i think the other thing is that the people side of the business. And this is, you know, no, you know, especially real estate stuff like this, like the value is in the people. That's your biggest, like, that's yes. your biggest value is your relationships and who you are. And so like, we're seeing that more and more, like how do people stand out? Like, you know, be yourself, 
and, and add value and the relationships and you caring and your empathy and all of these things, I think there's going to be a huge shift. Even, so there's this digital transformation and then there's this human aspect, which is kind of the opposite. Right. And right. how they meet in the middle. And that's where I talk about like Bomb was created for a time like this. Like literally those two things, like we're using technology to, con to connect humans in a way that they wouldn't necessarily be able to do um, without our technology. And so it's... Um, it's, it's, I, I, I think the swing back to relationships, one, because we've been separated and people are like, I just want to hug somebody. For sure. For like sure. Like I literally dropped off my HOA payment yesterday to the people and the guy's like, Hey man, you want to come in? Like, what, what are you doing? Like, and I'm like, Hey, I gotta go to a meeting. Like, <laughs> and like Here's my mask, he, hold he on. never invited me into his house before. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and so this human connection, I think the human is coming back. Um, and, and that will, um, and that won't, that, that will just accelerate there too. So you've got this weird thing that's going to happen of where technology and the human side of things is going to come together. And, you know, the way we work is not going to, um, be the way it was. You see it in real estate, you see it in corporate sales, you see it in all of these places. Like it's just not going to be the same because people's behavior through trauma, right? Like people's behaviors change. And so it's, you know, unless you're on that bandwagon, like you're going to literally be left behind. I agree. And that was uh, super well said. And it got me, I'm like, I'm, I'm, every time I do a podcast, I end up taking notes, right? I become the student, right? Listening like, oh yeah, that's real. Okay. I should think about this, right? Have you read the book, uh, Humans Are Underrated or Overrated? Humans Are Overrated? Everybody should check that book out. It's it just, as you were saying this, it was reminding me, this book came out a couple of years ago and uh, one of my, uh, one of my veeps gave it to me and said, hey, check this out, right? And of course the title, you read it and you're like, what do you mean? I'm like, humans are overrated. What are you talking about? But the book is about the soft skills, your ability to communicate, your ability to articulate your value, your ability to solve problems, your ability to listen effectively, your ability to have tremendous empathy, right? All the things that AI and, and outsourcing to Asia and automation can't do, right? The whole point of the book was like, these are the superpowers going, you know, going forward. And, you know, I say a lot of strange things. One is, uh, I actually said recently that th to a certain extent, and I listen, as I say this to you, for all my friends out there, listen to me before you judge me. I say that COVID-19 has actually been a gift for some of us because it caused us to slow down. Now I know as I say that I have friends, you have friends. I have friends that ha are unemployed now. I have friends that are suffering now and I have teammates that have, you know, immediate family members that have passed away. I'm not taking, you know me well enough, right? When I say it's a gift, it is a gift in that we finally slowed down. We've been in an 11 year bull market and the family time, the connection time, the personal time, the Zoom time, forcing us to have to improve, forcing us to have to articulate our value, forcing us to get comfortable with technology like you know, that it just seems to be the way of the world. Things happen and we shift. 9-11 happened, we shifted, right? Like, it didn't, you didn't have a choice, right? It just became the norm. 2007, 8, 9, 10 shifted, and er, that caused us to shift. So I think that's an important book for everybody to check out. And there's a bunch more, which I'll, I'm going to do a podcast on just all the books that I'm absorbing right now. But everything is about the customer of the future, the 10 laws of trust, Right, all these things, Connor, that you're talking about, I think are tools and books that people need to lean into right now. Thoughts? Yeah, you know, we we went to a conference, AI superpowers, right? Yeah. Um, and and it it talks about kind of the 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 U.S. China and who's going to be the AI superpower and all this. And there's a TED talk by um, Kai Fu Lee, is is the guy's name, and. And, and basically he, he goes through his whole thing and it, you know, it scares the crap out of you about all the things yeah. that AIs do. But in the end, he's like, 
what, what a machine will never do is love or yeah. listen or have empathy or there, there, there's, and only humans can do that. Like only humans can do that. And he talks about like w- what things will be taken out by these technologies and what things they'll never be able to do. You know, in his opinion, you know, some people, you know, think of the singularity and all these things, but, yeah. you know, I don't believe that that's going to happen. Like, I don't believe you can recreate a, a human with, you know, a soul with a, with a, with a machine. So, um, and, and like love yeah. is what it comes love. down to, man. Like humans like can do that. And so it's, it's, it's really interesting to see that all the things that I care about are actually being pointed out by all these things that are supposed to kill it. Yeah. Yeah. So it is, man, it is. So, you know, thank you, uh, Connor, just for being so open and sharing and vulnerable and telling stories and giving insights. And I, you know, as always, I finished with like the questions that I wanted to ask you versus the questions that I actually asked you and then all kinds of notes and things that I'm writing down here. So just in, in closing thoughts, right. Um, you know, what do you want, what do you want to say to the, the Tom Ferry ecosystem as we wrap this up? Yeah. You know, one of the things, you know, that, that, you know, I think of every time, you know, when like I get scared about stuff, um, I get scared. And whenever I have that feeling, what leaders do is they don't have it figured out. They don't, they don't have all the answers, but leaders lean into that fear. Yeah. And, you know, that's one of the things that every time I feel that sense of fear, I tell myself, I'm like, Connor, lean in, lean into it. Because, you know, like one of my mentors told me, they can't eat you. And so yeah. lean in. And so like that has helped me through all of this, like, because it's an emotional roller coaster when you're in the, the, these types of spaces of where there's a lot of unknowns, but leaders yeah. lean in, man. And, um, and, and it's, it, a leader is, uh, is not born. It's, um, you know, they're made. So I encourage everybody to lean in. Love it, man. Love it. Well, I appreciate you brother. And thank you so much for the time today. I know we said 30 minutes. I think we're now at an hour and a half. So we're right on track with our timing as always, but, uh, but it's like, a, like any other one of our mastermind meetings. So, all right. Thank you for having me, man. Uh, I miss you. Uh, I can't wait to see you again soon. And um, yeah, yeah, thanks for having me, man. I'm looking forward to that big Connor hug, man. I'm, I'm ready for that. I'm ready for that too. So, all right, my friends, make sure you check out bombbomb.com. Uh, you know, if you understand Connor's values, you know, you'll see how, how this company is so in alignment with it, including that teacher thing. Does the teacher thing, is it still going? Like if they, if someone watching this knows a teacher, what do they do? What's that? Bombbomb.com forward slash educate education. Okay. Or just go to bombbomb.com. There's a link at the bottom. Cool. So check out bombbomb.com, especially like for this to any teachers you have or friends of yours that are, that are, you know, teachers, like that's a really cool gift. All right, everybody. Thank you so much as always. Right. Write down some notes. What did you learn from this? What's the big takeaway? Share it if it's meaningful for you. Give me a comment on any one of the channels wherever you're watching this. And we'll look forward to talking to you guys next week on the Tom Ferry Podcast Experience. We're out.